Alright, so today I'm going to talk about group theory. Group theory is the branch of math that got me into pure math, so pretty excited to talk about it. Um, but before I get started, I just want to say that you should probably have some proofwriting experience or some equivalent of it, like a discrete math course or a proofwriting course, or the series will be kind of hard to follow just because there's going to be a lot of proofs. Um, but anyways, let's get started. So if we're going to talk about group theory, we should probably know what a group is. And a group is just going to be some set, which we'll just for convenience call G, uh, with some binary operation. Uh, we can of course label it however we want, but we usually denote it with some dot, like a multiplication symbol. Um, and the notation for a group with some operation is like this, where you put the set first, and then the operation next. Um, so for example, an example of a set equipped with a binary operator uh, would be the integers under addition, um, because the integers are a set, and then addition is a binary operation. In other words, you add two numbers together, um, but there are, of course, other different sets and um, operations that we consider on that set. Um, so we always need to know the set and the operation that we're dealing with. Um, and for it to be considered a group, as opposed to just some binary operation on a set, like addition or multiplication of integers, uh, we need it to satisfy some additional axioms. So we're taking some set that has some operation, but it's going to have some additional structure. And that extra structure will allow us to um, do a lot of things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. So the first ax axiom that we have uh, is going to be closure. If you take any element A, B, in our set G, uh, then A times B, um, which I'll commonly refer to uh, whenever we've got two elements and we're operating on them with our operator, um, we're going to say A times B, um, where the times doesn't necessarily mean like multiplication of integers or something, it just means using our binary operator. So A times B is also going to be in G. So in other words, you can never get out of the set uh, by acting on it with elements within the set, which is why it's called closure. Um, the next axiom that we're going to impose on our set is that there exists some element E in our group so that for any a in g, e times a and a times e is equal to a. So whenever we act on any element of the set with our identity, we get the same thing back out, which is why we're going to call it the identity element. And um, we'll often denote it as e. Um, sometimes some other books will use one, and that's also a perfectly valid notation. You could use whatever you want for an identity element, uh, and a little bit will actually prove that the identity element, um, is always unique. And addition, in addition to this, since the identity element always exists within a group, uh, we're always free to choose elements uh, within a group. So whenever we're doing proofs and we're like, let this be an element of G, uh, that thing, uh, that letting this be in the set is always a well-defined operation. We can always pick an element in the set because it's not empty. So for our next one, uh, we have inverses. Uh, for any element A in G, there exists some element a inverse in that same set G, such that A times A inverse and A inverse times A 
are both equal to the identity element. So, in other words, there's a way to undo everything in the set, kind of. Uh, if I have an element A, I can get to the identity by performing some inverse operation. Now, lastly, we have associativity. So, for any A, B, and C in G, the associative property holds, uh, which means if we have A times B in parentheses times C, uh, so in other words, you want to think about, you would do A times B, and then whatever the result of that, you multiply it with C. And then on the right-hand side, we have A times, and then in parentheses, B times C. So you would think about this product as doing A times whatever the product of B times C is. Uh, so in other words, you're not changing the um, ordering of the elements. Um, like you still have an A first, a B second, and a C third uh, on both sides. Um, so... You're not changing the order of the elements, but you're changing the order in which you do the multiplication. Uh, and that's allowed whenever you have associativity. Um, if it was the case uh, that we could change order in our multiplication, so if A times B does in fact equal B times A for all the elements, um, then that group is going to be called abelian. Uh, after some famous mathematician uh, named Abel. Um, <clears throat> so that's basically it. Um, those are all the different axioms for a group. We've got closure, so you can multiply things together and stay in the set. Identity, um, you can always act on an element with the identity, get the same thing back. Inverse, uh, there's always an action that takes you back to the identity, uh, and then associativity. It doesn't matter, in a, in a sense, it doesn't matter how you arrange your parentheses. So, just for an example, um, the three things listed here are going to form groups. Uh, the integers under addition, um, certainly if we add any two integers, we get another integer out. The identity in this case would be zero. If we add zero to any number, um, then we get the same thing back out. Um, and then inverse, if we've got, say, like five, the inverse of five is negative five. Um, and the inverse of negative seven is seven. Um, and no matter what element we choose, to zero by adding the opposite, uh, in a sense. Um, and then associativity, uh, it doesn't matter how you uh, group the parentheses whenever you add, uh, so it's associative, and this forms a group. And then a another um, thing that forms a group is the set R, um, the real line. Uh, without zero, under multiplication. Um, and that's certainly closed. Um, if you multiply any two non-zero things together, uh, you get a non-zero thing back. Uh, identity, in this case, is the number one. Uh, you multiply one by any number. Um, it's not zero. And you get the number back out, which is why um, the identity... Uh, notation is sometimes used as one. Um, and then associativity, uh, just like the integers, doesn't matter how you group the parentheses. Um, you're still good. And that will form a group as well. And then um, one of my favorites is the Rubik's Cube. Uh, under composing different moves together, uh, actually forms a group. Uh, I won't really get into much detail, um, but if you play around with the Rubik's Cube, um, 
you could probably convince yourself that this is a group as well. All right, and then to finish off our examples, um, I just want to point out two things that actually do not form group groups. The positive integers uh, under addition does not form a group uh, because there is no identity element. Um, there isn't a positive integer that you can add to anything um, and get the same thing back out. Like, um, for example, if we take the number 1, uh, is there a positive integer that we could add to 1 and still get 1? Uh, nope, because that would be, we'd be wanting 0 uh, to be that identity element, but we don't have it. Uh, in addition to that, there's also no inverses. Uh, so um, there's no positive integer that we can add to 1 and um, get the identity, which we don't have. Uh, so in other words, this um, set operation combo um, is not a group for multiple reasons. Um, but in order to fail being a group, you only have to fail one of those axioms, which we certainly do here. And then the entire real numbers under multiplication does not form a group. Um, and this one might be a little bit harder to think about, but zero um, is not uh, invertible. Um, because um, zero times anything um, is zero. Uh, but we would want our identity to be 1, because if we have, like, the number uh, 2, uh, the identity for that element uh, would be 1. Um, so we need everything, and then if we want an identity for, say, 3, we want to do 3 times 1, and that would be 3. So, in other words, we kind of want uh, 1 to be the identity, uh, because it works for all elements except for zero. Uh, but we can't have an identity for all the elements in a group except one. Um, so it doesn't have an identity. And if it doesn't have an identity, then it can't really have inverses for everything. Um, <clears throat> so um, that's all I want to say about um, examples of groups. So I think we can... Um, get started on some basic properties of groups. Um, so unless we otherwise state, um, we're going to let G be a group and it's um, this be the multiplication symbol uh, for the group. And the first thing I want to prove is that the identity element of a group is unique. So there's in a sense, no ambiguity when I talk about the identity element. Um, if um, you have a group, there's exactly one identity element and no others. If you've got something else that looks like the identity one, um, and our proof is going to be based on that same exact idea. Um, so, like I mentioned earlier, we can all elements in a set. Uh, well, elements in a group, um, because a group is always not empty. Um, if it only has the identity element, uh, it's called the trivial group, uh, because all the axioms, <coughs> my bad, um, are satisfied trivially. Um, and what we're going to do is suppose that we have another identity. So if we suppose E prime... Uh, in G is also an identity element in G, then if we use the definition of the identity, then E times E inverse, uh, whoops, ah. Eh. So, by using the definition of the identity, we have E times E prime should give me the identity element. <laughs> but there's two of them. Uh, so... Uh, it's perfectly valid if we say E times um, E prime is equal to E, because E is an identity element. Um, 
my bad, because E prime is an identity element, uh, E times E prime should be equal to E. But likewise, since E is an identity element, E times E prime should give me back E prime. And then since this and this are equal to each other, um, E is E times E prime is also equal to E prime. So E is actually the same thing as E prime. And since we started out saying, oh, we've got another identity element in G, and then prove that they are actually the exact same thing, then the identity is actually unique, um, like we initially claimed. So we're done. Uh, and just to see that this makes uh, sense, if we think about the group of integers uh, like before, we said that we claimed that the identity element was zero under addition. If we add zero to any integer, we get the same thing back, and it's the identity element. And just knowing the structure of the integers, um, there isn't any other uh, integer that we can add um, to another one and get the same thing back every time uh, for all the integers. So, um, this uh, result right here lines up with what we also talked about uh, with the integers. Uh, there's only one identity. Uh, in the case of the integers under addition, it's zero. Um, and there isn't any other identity lurking about. <coughs> so... Next, I want to talk about something called the cancellation law. Um, if A, B, and C are in our group, and if A times B equals A times C, then B is actually equal to C. Um, and this looks kind of obvious, because if we've got A times B equals a times C. Uh, we all passed algebra in high school, so you just like cross out the A's, and we have B equals C. Um, so it looks obvious, um, but we'll actually need to use all the axioms um, that we have uh, for a group. So it's not going to be, I mean, it's going to be not that bad, but it's not as easy as it sounds. Alright, so uh, to prove this, uh, if we take the hypothesis and multiply both sides on the left um, by A inverse, what we get is A inverse times, and then in parentheses A times B, equals A inverse times parentheses A times C. Now, from here on, um, we're going to simplify using the different axioms, so namely associativity, inverses, and identity, um, to figure out that B actually does indeed equal C. So to do this, uh, we start with what we had up here, um, and then what we do next is use associativity to put the parentheses right here onto these two elements. So we have in parentheses a inverse times a times b, and we do the same thing with the right hand side and get in parentheses a inverse times a um, times c. And then we can use the definition of an inverse, because by the definition of an inverse, a inverse times a better give me back the identity element. Um, so we have e times b equals, and then same thing for the right-hand side, uh, but E times C. And then what's the definition of an identity element? Well, if we multiply by the identity, we get the same thing back out. So E times B better equal B, and E times C better equal C. So um, B does equal C, like we claimed. Um, and 
Um, so this result basically says if we have something like this, a times b equals a times c, we can indeed cross out like we would intuitively think we could. Now, this does not mean that we can do, I don't know, something along the lines of this. This is not necessarily true. Uh, it may be true in some instances, but it's not true in general. Um, so if you want to cancel stuff out uh, like this, then the element that you're quote-unquote canceling out better be on the same exact side. Like in this example, a times b equals a times c, then a is on the left-hand side of both of these equations, so we can cancel out the a. But if it, it is not on the same side, so if a times b and then c times a, well, a is on the left-hand side here, and on the right hand side here. So we can't necessarily cancel it out. Um, so that's one instance in where a group is different than, um, I guess, intuitive um, multiplication stuff in high school whenever you're um, doing algebra in high school. Um, because not all groups are commutative. You can't always um, switch the order. If it was possible to switch the order, uh, then the result would be true. We could just switch the result uh, CA into AC if the group was a billion, and then cancel out then. Uh, but we can't necessarily do that all the time. So um, if you've got elements on the same side of an equation, you can cancel them out if need be. So, using this cancellation law, uh, you can actually pretty easily prove that the inverse element um, of an element in a group is unique, just like the identity. So there's no ambiguity in talking about the inverse of an element. Uh, so whenever I say um, the inverse of A is A inverse, um, there's not two different things that can pop into mind. There's only one. Um, and I would encourage you to try this proof. Uh, you can use the same proof technique uh, we used in showing the identity element was unique, um, in addition to using the cancellation law. Um, <clears throat> I might uh, post a proof in the um, description, uh, but I want you to try it first. So to finish this video off, um, we're going to prove something that's sometimes called the shoes and socks theorem. Um, if we have two elements, A and B, in G, uh, then the way that you compute the inverse of A times B is that you do B inverse times A inverse. So... Um, in other words, if you want to uh, invert a product, um, then you reverse the order of the product and take inverses of those. So if we have A times B in parentheses inverse, then the inverse of that is, well, we reverse the order of these things. So we put B first and A second and then we put inverses on them. So AB, parentheses inverse, is B inverse A inverse. And if we had A times B times C, in parentheses, inverse, well, we reverse the order, so we do C times B, times A, and then put inverses on all of these. So in a sense, if you want to undo something, 
uh, you reverse the order and invert them. Um, and this is called the shoes and socks theorem because um, whenever you put your shoes and socks on, um, you put your socks on first, then your shoes, hopefully, um, and then to take them off, well, the way that you take them off is that you take your shoes off first and then your socks. Um, so the way that you take them off is the opposite of the way that you put them on. Um, <laughs> so to prove this, um, we're going to simply multiply um, A times B in parentheses by B inverse A inverse in parentheses. Um, and we're going to show that that is equal to the identity element and then kind of just say it's similar uh, for the other case where um, we've got this flipped. Uh, because to be an inverse, um, if you multiply on the right by the inverse, you get the identity. And if you multiply on the left by the inverse, you also get the identity. Uh, so we'll just do that first case. And then the second case is pretty similar. Um, so if you have a times b in parentheses, times b inverse a inverse in parentheses, um, we can use associativity um, to kind of, essentially what we're just going to be doing is um, eventually moving the parentheses here uh, by a few uses of associativity um, to get b times b inverse here, which is e, um, and then a times a inverse on the outside. Um, so to do that, we first move the parentheses on this side of the equation. Yep, good enough. Um, we're going to move the parentheses on this side of the equation. So we have a times, and then in parentheses, uh, b times this thing. So b times parentheses b inverse a inverse. And then we can use associativity on this thing right here. This product right here. And move the parentheses over to b times b inverse. And then times a inverse. But by the definition of the inverse, b times b inverse better equal e. So we've still got a on the outside. And then in parentheses e from here times a inverse. And what's e times a inverse? Well, e is the identity element. So we've just got a times a inverse, and what's a times a inverse? Well, it's the identity element. So we're done here. Um, technically, we have the other product. Uh, we need to show that this uh, is equal to the identity element, uh, but it's pretty much the same idea. Now, a another way uh, that you could prove this is uh, we know that a times b better have some inverse uh, because every element in a group is invertible. So if we just temporarily call uh, the inverse of it x, we know a times b in parentheses times x better equal the identity element. Uh, we know the identity, we know the inverse exists. Uh, because the product a, b must be invertible. Um, so we can also solve this equation for x. And I would recommend you also try that, um, um, <clears throat> because it's actually not too bad, um, and you do much of the same manipulation. So there's not always just one way to prove something. Uh, in many cases, there's multiple different ways that you could approach it. All right. So that's all I got for this video. Um, subscribe if you want to see more. Uh, leave a like if you enjoyed it. And comment if you have any questions.